two minutes. Um, we'll give everybody a chance to join. I think um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me just fine. Um, it's my pleasure to be giving this lecture to the Physics of Life Online Summer School. Um, of course, we've done this in person in years past, um, but you know, I'm pleased that we're reaching such a large audience this summer, and I'm looking forward to um, answering your questions and uh, telling you a little bit about neuroscience. So I'm Mala Murthy. I'm a professor in the Neuroscience Institute here at Princeton, and I've been part of the Center for the Physics of Biological Function um, uh, for the past few years. And, um, you know, the summer school is really special because it brings students, you know, with an interest in physics um, and biophysics in particular uh, to interact with us. And here at Princeton, you know, there's uh, so many diverse scientists that participate in this biophysics program. You know, myself, I don't have training in physics. Um, I'm a neuroscientist by training, but I, um, you know, have derived a lot of, um, you know, joy and also um, have learned a lot from interacting with my physics colleagues. And I think you'll see today how, um, you know, neuroscience and physics are intimately intertwined. And um, uh, hopefully I can spark some interest in neuroscience and behavior uh, in those of you attending today. So the focus of the lecture today is really going to be on brains and behavior. Um, and, and, you know, when you think about it, the brain is really in charge of generating behavior of, you know, how we interact with the world, um, what we say, what we do, how we move through the world. And neuroscientists really seek to understand how it is uh, that the brain, this, you know, uh, large organ in your head and um, you know, your, your entire nervous system is able to generate um, this behavior and allow us to interact successfully with the world. Um, so the brain over here on the left, you'll all recognize as the human brain. And of course, it's the brain, you know, we're most interested in. And, you know, we are really curious about ourselves and the way in which our own brains work. Um, but, you know, um, as neuroscientists, um, it's helpful uh, to simplify the problem a bit and study the brains of smaller organisms. And in the middle here, you'll see the brain of Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. And um, for those of you who attended the discussion this morning, um, you've already learned a bit about the fly brain, and so hopefully this lecture will build um, on that. On the right here, um, you can see two flies interacting. This is a male fly that's being tracked in blue, and a female fly that's being tracked in orange. And um, my lab, in collaboration with the lab of Josh Shavitz and driven by the work of a graduate student, Talmo Pereira, who's jointly advised by us, um, has been developing deep learning based methods to track animal behavior at high resolution. And this is an example of that where we're tracking the motion of the wings. You can see that that male fly is extending and vibrating his wing, one of his wings, every so often. Um, that generates an acoustic signal. We're going to talk about that today. Um, and this kind of automated tracking of behavior has been very useful to us in studying behavior. So we'll, we'll talk today a little bit about why it's so important as neuroscientists to focus on behavior, how to study it. Um, and then we'll talk also about the brain. And so, you know, here you can see that the Drosophila brain doesn't exactly look like the human brain. You know, structurally, they're quite a bit different. Um, but there are some similarities you'll notice at first glance. For example, this left-right symmetry, um, the fact that uh, there's a midline and there are two hemispheres. Um, so there are some similarities between the human and, and Drosophila brain. Um, and you'll see at the level of behavior, there's quite a few similarities. And that's because we think that one thing that bridges these two brains are um, what I, uh, neuroscientists like to refer to as neural computation. So, um, the brain is trying to compute something to interpret the sensory world or to drive behavior. And there is a uh, homology at the level of these computations between all brains. And that's what we really seek to understand is how neurons and circuits can underlie these computations that, you know, virtually all brains share. Um, and so I'm going to dig into that a little more as we go forward. 
Okay. So let me advance the slide. Okay, so before we do that, um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge my lab a bit. So here's a little photo of us on Zoom, um, which is how we interact these days. And, um, you know, it's been a rather stressful time over the last few months um, for all of us. And, you know, for me personally, interacting with these folks has been, you know, a bright spot um, over the last few months. Um, and, you know, most of you out there who are listening are, um, you know, studying physics, maybe uh, mostly undergraduates, um, planning for a career in science. And I just wanted to tell you that you know, most scientists will share with you that the greatest joy of doing science is actually interacting with other really smart people and getting to do science with a group of people. And, you know, at Princeton, I've had great collaborators and I have the fortune to interact with this group of people in my lab um, who have made science so enjoyable. So I wanted to give a little shout out to them before we get going with the lecture. Okay, so let's start with a very brief introduction to neurons and synapses. This might be a bit of a review for many of you, but um, I think it will help to ground us all. Um, so over here on the left, you can see three different neurons, uh, types of neurons from the vertebrate brain um, in three different parts of the brain, the retina, the olfactory system, and then cortex. And you can see that neurons come in different shapes and sizes, but there are some features they have in common. For example, they all have dendritic arbors that are quite elaborate. They all have a soma or a cell body, which is where the nucleus is. And then they all have a single long projecting axon um, that relays information to um, other neurons or brain regions. And so if we look at one of these neurons more closely, we can see that these blebs on the dendrites, which you can see here, um, contain spines, which is where the synapses are. So this is where the postsynaptic receptors would be concentrated. And um, these uh, dendritic spines receive information from axon terminals that make synapses there. And um, there are quite a number of synapses throughout the dendrites. And what happens is basically, um, in general, simple integration. That is, um, axons uh, that communicate with these dendrites create um, graded potentials, uh, analog signals, currents, that flow through the dendrites. These get summed at the level of the soma. And that current, if it's um, large enough, after summing over all the dendrites and all the inputs, can drive an action potential here at the initial segment of the axon, where there's a high concentration of voltage-gated ion channels. And so once that action potential is generated, um, it can travel quite a distance um, down uh, the axon. And we think of this as uh, a digital signal. So whereas uh, this is analog or graded, now we've converted this into uh, a binary output. Either you fire an action potential or you don't, and you fire it at a particular rate dependent on how fast these inputs are coming in. And then once that action potential makes it to the terminal, neurotransmitter can be released. You can see that here if you zoom into a synapse via vesicles, um, that neurotransmitter will bind to receptors on the postsynaptic surface um, and create current flows into the postsynaptic cell, which would be one of these little dendritic spines, um, carrying that signal to the next neuron. Now, if we take an electron micrograph of the synapse, which is shown here, um, you can see the vesicles clustered at the synapse. So there are these dark circles um, that are um, uh, very, come in very stereotype, stereotype sizes. Um, the other thing you'll see at the synapse on the presynaptic side are mitochondria. That's these giant um, vesicle looking structures. And that's because you need a lot of energy or ATP to fuel this process. And then on the postsynaptic side, so across this cleft, um, you'll often see an invagination of the membrane, and that's because there's a large number of postsynaptic receptors that are clustered in opposition to the synapse, waiting to receive the signal. So when the neurotransmitter comes out, it can bind to these receptors and um, generate current flows in the postsynaptic cell. Okay. Um, so we have a question asking if action potentials can be measured. Yes, indeed, they can by a number of means. Um, primary among them is uh, via electrodes. So electrodes can be inserted into neurons or nearby neurons to measure both these graded current flows and 
um, spikes or action potentials. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about neural recordings at the end of the lecture, so we'll get there. Okay, so um, given this kind of, um, you know, um, information flow within a neuron, which is common to all neurons. So uh, signals come in at the dendrites, they get integrated at the soma, and then they drive an action potential. This has led to sort of, um, you know, thinking about the nervous system as a simple feed forward neural network, okay? So you can imagine you have uh, a few inputs. So let's say input one comes from a visual neuron, a neuron in the retina. Input two comes from an olfactory neuron, a neuron in the nose. Um, these, uh, this information gets relayed to another neuron. Um, and then those neurons may make synapses onto a common downstream target. So this target um, might receive both, uh, sorry, this one, um, both visual and olfactory signals. And then that neuron may further uh, synapse onto another downstream target that receives other types of inputs, and then ultimately will synapse onto, let's say, motor neurons that drive changes in the behavior. Okay, and so given that information flow within a single neuron uh, is feed forward in this way, it's been you know, very common for scientists to think about the whole nervous system as being um, a series of these feed forward connections that go from sensory inputs on one end to behavioral outputs on the other end. However, um, once we've started mapping neural circuits at high resolution, um, and you learned about some of that this morning in the discussion section. Um, we now know that the ner most nervous systems don't look like this at all, that in general, brains are organized more like the picture below, where each node is connected to numerous other nodes um, that um, are connected back often to the original node, creating what we think of as a recurrent neural network. Um, where, for example, in this picture, um, this neuron may synapse onto this cell, which may then make a feedback connection right back to this neuron. Um, and you can imagine if that is a common property of circuits, uh, you get an architecture that looks much more like this. Okay, now when the underlying architecture looks like this, it then becomes very challenging to understand how this kind of circuitry generates behavior. Um, there isn't sort of a, a map that tells you clearly how to get from A to B. And so that's the challenge we're faced with in virtually all uh, animal brains, from uh, the simplest to the most complicated. And so it therefore helps to actually focus on a, ner a nervous system with smaller numbers of nodes or neurons. And so um, today, we're going to talk almost exclusively about Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. Um, that's because that's the model system we study in my lab. Um, but um, as you can see by the numbers of neurons, um, you know, it has far fewer neurons in its nervous system, 250,000 throughout the entire brain, plus its spinal cord, um, which is called a ventral nerve cord in flies. Um, there are organisms with fewer uh, neurons, for example, the worm, but the fly sort of sits here at a number of neurons um, that's amenable to neuroscientific studies, but also is in a model system that's capable of pretty complex behaviors. And I'm gonna explain some of those behaviors to you today. Now there are animals with more neurons, right? So honeybees um, are capable of interesting types of, uh, uh, you know, uh, learning that's, um, you know, definitely outpace flies, they have more neurons. Um, mice and rats, you know, come in at uh, millions of neurons, 200 million for the rats. And now humans have the most neurons at all, 86 billion, okay? And so when you look at these numbers, it becomes clear that it's hard to jump into the human brain to make sense of behavior. Um, and starting with a simpler system is going to make the problem much easier. Let me take a second to look at some of these questions. Um, Okay, so some of these questions are about how you can generate behavior from so few neurons, and I'm gonna get to that, so hold on a second. Um, okay, so what we're gonna talk about today is how you connect neural circuits to behavior, 
And um, I've already made the point that it's useful to start with simpler circuits. I hope that's obvious to you why fewer numbers in neuron would make the problem of connecting the two easier. Um, I'm gonna talk for a little bit this morning about tools to model behavior. And I will explain to you why understanding the behavior itself is so critical for understanding the nervous system. We'll talk a little bit about why connectomes, basically the wiring diagram, having a map of the diagram is so useful. And I'll only touch on that because um, in the discussion section this morning, you spent quite a bit of time on this topic. And then at the end, I'm gonna tell you about some tools to manipulate neural circuits, that is to turn neurons on and turn them off and to record from neural circuits. And so hopefully you can start to see how um, these model systems, and flies are only one, I would say another very popular model system for um, neuroscientists at the moment is the mouse. Um, it has far more neurons, which does make the problem more complicated, um, but it's starting to have many of these same tools, which is gonna make it possible to um, basically crack the neural code and understand behaviors. And you know, working on mice is useful because they're mammals and their brain architecture is a little more similar to ours. Um, but of course, there are still some significant differences there. Okay, so um, one of the reading assignments I gave you was this review article from 2016 um, from Haberkern and Jai Raman. And I like it because um, if you haven't been thinking about behavior in animals, it's a nice overview of the complexity of behaviors that even insects are capable of. And you know, when you go about your, your life, you interact with a lot of insects, um, but you may not be thinking about the complexity of their brains and what they're capable of. So um, I just wanted to give you these three examples to make the point. The first one in the article, and uh, the review article is dragonfly prey capture. So um, dragonflies are these wonderful insects with two sets of wings. Um, they have, they're capable of pretty amazing aerodynamic feats. Um, if you've ever been out on the water, uh, you can watch these dragonflies flying around and appreciate them. Um, but they're usually doing that to hunt for prey. And in this particular example, they're hunting uh, a fruit fly, um, uh, my favorite organism. And um, what you can see is that the dragonfly, instead of flying directly to where the fruit fly is right now, actually flies in a path to where the fruit fly will be in the future. And to do this, the dragonfly has to predict where the fly is heading. And it does that based on the fly's current speed and orientation, such that it can predict, forward predict where the fly is headed. Now we do this all the time. For example, if we're playing tennis, um, you know, we're predicting where the ball is going and then we swing our racket in the direction where the ball will be, not where it currently is at the moment. But the fact that dragonflies do this is quite astounding and it suggests there's a complexity within the visual system that makes it capable of this kind of forward prediction. And if we're interested in that problem, uh, we can study it in the brain of a dragonfly versus um, you know, having to uh, study it in the brain of a human. Another example in this article is uh, honeybee learning. So um, honeybees uh, are pretty smart insects. And if, if you give them a, a colored patch, for example, they can do a task called delayed match to sample, which means if you know, I hold up a yellow card to you, and then I put it away, and then I hold up a yellow and a blue card, and I ask you, which card did I hold up before? You know, you'll say the yellow one. Um, well, bees can do that. Um, so following a delay, they can move into this chamber and they can fly towards the card that matches the one they'd seen before um, if you give them a reward, which is usually sugar water. And you know, this yellow circle may look something like the flowers these bees have to target. They have pretty exceptional color vision. Um, but the fact that they can do this suggests they're capable of the type of learning um, that we might like to study in the bee brain because the bee brain is um, a bit simpler and therefore easier to study this kind of short-term memory. And then the last example I wanted to bring up is ant navigation and pathfinding. So these desert ants, cataglyphus, live in a featureless environment. So out in the desert, there are really no landmarks they can use to navigate, yet they're capable of leaving their nest, which is uh, shown here, 
and making a direct line to the site where they found food previously, which can be quite far away, 15 meters away. Um, and the, re the reason they're able to do this is when they found food the first time, um, they retained a memory of how far they had walked from the nest to the feeder and which direction they had turned. So they kept track of their heading um, and their position in the world, which they measure by noting the position of the sun. It's the only landmark they have access to. And that information alone is allow them, allows them to do this path integration where they can keep track of how far they've gone and where they've gone so that the next time they have to go out in search of food, they can make a direct line there. Now we do this kind of thing all the time, you know, to find the coffee shop the first time, we may have to use our map, navigate around, take a lot of twists and turns. But once we get there, the next time we go, we can make a straight line because we know, um, you know, where the coffee shop is within our world. Um, the fact that ants can do this is quite astounding and again, makes it possible to study this kind of process, navigation and path integration in a simpler brain. Okay, so now I'm gonna to transition to talking about a more complex behavior, um, but before I do, um, let me um, take a look at some of these questions. Um, so do bees have ultraviolet vision? Yes, they do. Um, they have photoreceptors that are dedicated to seeing UV. Um, how are ants able to store quantities such as regular direction and distance in their nervous system? That's a really interesting question. It wasn't actually solved in ants, it was solved in fruit flies. And I'm gonna to explain to you why the fruit fly makes it possible to solve these questions uh, in a way that's easier than in, uh, in, in an ant, for example. Um, so there's a part of the brain known as the central complex that's very important for um, keeping track of direction and heading, and that part of the brain is critical for that process. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, ants do also release a scent trail. Um, so somebody asked about that. Um, but desert ants don't have access to scent trails because it's extremely hot in the desert and um, there's no way to use olfaction to find the feeder. That's a good question. Um, okay, I'm going to talk more about choosing Drosophila as a model system. And I think... Um, okay, I answered the question about ants and chemical trails, and okay, some, uh, I think that that is good for now. I'll come back to some of these questions later. Okay, all right, so moving on, we're going to talk about um, uh, quantifying behavior is a lens into the brain. Okay, so the idea is that by quantifying behavior, we understand what the brain is trying to compute. Okay, so I want to get you to think about why it's important to quantify behavior. Okay, so let's take as an example something my lab works on, which is acoustic communication. So this is a video of a male and a female interacting. The male is being tracked in gray and the female is being tracked in magenta. Now, this tracking was done. Uh, years ago, before we developed the deep learning methods to track wings and legs. Um, so here we're just tracking the center of mass, the centroid, and the heading of the fly. Okay, um, but this is all automated. And then the other thing we can do here is um, we can segment the song that the male is producing. So if you'll notice, there are these rectangles um, along the bottom of the chamber and there's mesh on top of them. And that's because um, we're tiling the floor of the chamber with microphones. And so that makes it possible to record at every moment uh, in time as the um, male runs around um, what, he, what sounds he's producing. And I told you before that he generates sounds by extending and vibrating a wing. So we also um, develop software to automate the um, segmentation of these songs. So we knew that songs and flies come in two flavors, either this pulse mode or the sign mode. And so we could automatically find those features. And this gives us access to these large data sets of you know, male and female tracks and sound at every moment in time. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little brief intro to song. Um, so this is a short clip of Drosophila melanogaster song, about 16 seconds. Um, you can see the spectrogram below. 
and then the actual microphone signal on top. So one of the modes that male flies sing is this pulse mode. It's uh, short impulses separated by intervals. And then the other mode is sign song, which is basically a frequency modulated tone. And males will alternate between these two modes to compose song bouts. And um, these bouts are directed at the female and he'll sing hundreds of them before a mating decision occurs, you know, before the female decides to mate with them or not. And because the duration of each of these modes is variable, and because he's rapidly alternating between the two modes, this essentially acts to individualize these song bouts. So a male, an individual male, will never sing exactly the same song bout pattern twice to a female while he's interacting with her. Now I'm going to play you the 16 seconds of song so you can listen to your, for yourself uh, what this sounds like. Um, hopefully you enjoyed hearing that. I think if you read the paper I assigned, you were probably all wondering what the song sounded like. So there you go. Um, and um, the males stand quite close to the female to sing, and her ear is actually specialized to hear these quiet sounds. Um, but I didn't change the frequency at all. So I amplified it so you could hear it, but um, that's actually the frequency that males produce the song at. I'm not going to talk about hearing today. Um, the auditory system is wonderful and interesting, and we do a lot of research on that aspect of the problem. Um, but today I'm actually just going to focus on the song and have the males generate the song. Okay, so, so these bouts are variable from one to the next, and um, this is 30 minutes of courtship between a male and a female. He produces a lot of song. He's just singing, you know, uh, almost all the time. And um, if you zoom into one of these song bouts, we can ask the question, what determines whether he's going to sing the blue sign mode or the red pulse mode at each moment in time? So what influences his decision making? Now, um, one possibility is that, you know, the nervous system is just noisy. You know, it's made up of all these nodes that are interconnected and there's noise in the system. And so every time he tries to generate a bout, he just doesn't do it the same way because the system's a bit noisy. He has a script for what he wants to say. He just, every time he triggers that script, it comes out slightly differently. The other possibility is that actually um, the male is making decisions about what to sing based on something in his environment. And that's what we sought to address using a modeling technique. So the model we chose was the generalized linear model. And some of you asked in your questions, why did you choose this model? Um, so, you know, for natural behavior, there are a lot of correlations between virtually everything, right? Um, you know, the male behavior is correlated with the female behavior because he's chasing her. His song is correlated with his own behavior because, you know, they're coupled together. How do you parse what's uh, predictive versus nearly correlated. And the GLM allows us to do this by having um, a sparse prior within it that allows us to take these stimulus histories which represent the trajectories of each of these uh, parameters uh, that characterize the interaction between the male and the female. So these parameters basically define um, female speed, the male speed, or the interactions between the male and the female. Um, and the sparse prior allows us to build filters that basically reveal which features are most predictive of song decisions versus merely correlated with some other more predictive feature. Okay, so that's why we chose this model. <coughs> um, and the output of the model are basically um, what the male is doing at a given moment in time. So here we're predicting whether the male starts about a song in pulse mode or he starts a bout of song in sign mode, okay? And we're gonna use these inputs as the predictors, as the stimulus histories. So you can, um, let's just start with these song bout starts. So if the male is oriented towards the female, um, he could be singing, here he's sticking out his wing and he's producing song. And if he's singing, he could start in either pulse mode or he could start in sign mode. 
Now, the other option is that he's oriented towards her, but his wings are not extend extended, so he's not producing song. And our GLM is going to try to predict whether the male is singing in pulse mode versus not singing or starting in sign mode versus not singing. Okay. Now, if the model is perfect, uh, basically every time he's not singing, we predict he's not singing. And every time he is singing, we predict he's singing and we predict the right mode, sign or pulse. Okay. And so that's what um, a graph of predicted versus actual will look like. Now, if our model is ter oh, and then the probability of being correct would be some high number, like 0.97. Now, if our model is not good, um, all these points will lie at 0.5, and that's because we subsample the data 50-50. So we choose an equal number of times when he doesn't sing and an equal number of times when he does sing. And so all of our points are going to lie along here at the middle of the graph, and the probability of being correct, the bottom the floor now is going to be 0.5. Okay? Chance. So how do we do? The GLM um, shows a significant improvement over this null model, um, a 34% improvement in predicting uh, bouts that start in pulse mode, and a 26% improvement for bouts that start in sign mode. And um, now you may be asking, why isn't this perfect? Why, why doesn't the graph look like I said it would with the points at either end? And there's a few reasons for that. One is that um, there truly is noise in the nervous system that we're not incorporating here, and that has to account for something. Um, there's also measurement error, right? When we track the flies and record their song, we make some error in detecting it um, with our automated measurements. And then the third reason that turned out to be quite significant is that the male actually makes different decisions at different moments in time dependent on his internal state. So in a follow-up study, um, which I'm not going to have time to talk to you about today, um, we showed that if we add an HMM to this model, a hidden Markov model to this GLM, we actually can boost these prediction numbers up to you know, 80%. And um, what we went on to show is that um, these decisions are actually dependent on the state the male's brain is in. Um, uh, one of three different states. And I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that at the end, um, you know, models to estimate internal state. Um, but I hope that this resonates with you a bit because I think you heard of that a little bit about internal states of the brain this morning during the discussion section. Okay, so coming back to this study, if we think about a song bout, we can um, represent it in this graphical form. A male starts off not singing, and then if he sings, he's going to have to start in either sign or pulse mode. He's going to have to stick with that mode for some time, transition back and forth, right? He flips between these modes to make a bout, and then eventually he has to end his song. And what the model showed, what the GLM showed, is that these features, the male's movement, the female's movement, and the interaction between them are predictive of each of these transitions. And the most predictive features from the model turned out to be the male's own motion, his forward velocity, and the distance between the male and female. Now, the model not only tells us which features are predictive, but they tell us the time scales over which those features are predictive. So for example, distance is predictive of decisions to start about in sign mode with a lag of about 150 milliseconds. So if the male gets close to the female 150 milliseconds prior to the start of a song bout, he'll start in sign mode. The same is true for male motion. It's predictive prior to the start of a bout, but it's predictive of decisions to start in pulse mode. And the time scale over which it's predictive is right up until the time that the bout starts. So there's a difference in these time scales, which tells us something about how the nervous system is controlling these decisions. Okay, so um, to sum up this part, we um, used large data sets and automated behavioral analysis to show that there were fluctuations in song patterns over time. Um, we also showed that there's fluctuations in intensity. I, I didn't tell you about that today, but there's separate work from my lab showing that that is also the case. Um, males sing louder when they're further away and they sing softer when they're closer. And then the modeling, the GLMs, um, showed us that it's cues from the female that are predictive of these uh, patterns. And subsequent work um, by silencing um, neural pathways showed us how these cues were predictive. So it turns out 
that males use their visual system to measure distance. So they're constantly measuring how far away the female is. And um, to measure how fast the female is moving, um, they don't directly use vision, they use their own self-motor system. So they're reading out how fast they're moving um, as a proxy for how fast the female is moving. Now, why is that a good proxy? Well, during courtship, he's mostly chasing her. And so his speed is coupled to her speed, and it's um, uh, more efficient to read out his own speed. And that has to do with the fact that there are many cues from the female that can change his speed, olfaction, vision, taste, mechanosensation. Um, and they all kind of converge onto changes in his speed. So changes in his speed is a reliable readout for how fast um, she's moving. So these are the cues that matter most to him and they shape the song. Now, why did I take you through this? I took you through this because without quantifying the behavior and without the models, we wouldn't know to look within the visual and locomotor pathways of the male to try to understand how the brain generates song, right? We might have simply looked within the song motor pathway, the neurons that control the wing that allow it to extend and vibrate. And that, that would be useful, that would be a good start, but we wouldn't know that those neurons are controlled or modulated by neurons in these pathways. And that's what quantifying the behavior in the models get us, which is critical for um, understanding the nervous system. Um, I told you that a large part of my lab also works on how the female hears the song and changes her behavior in response. And I just wanted to point that out because um, if you look at, um, no, sorry, the uh, computer's hanging a bit. Okay, I think the movie started. Um, if you look at the behavior, um, you'll notice that it's an elaborate closed loop. You know, the male is chasing the female, um, she's responding to him, and um, it should remind you a bit of the kind of closed loop interaction we used to have more often before the pandemic started, which is that the things I would say um, would have an impact on how you respond, and your responses in real time would affect what I say. And there would be a closed loop interaction between the two of us um, that would pattern my behavior in yours. And that's really critical for having a conversation. Um, so, um, we think, therefore, that flies are a good model system in which to study these kind of closed loop interactions that form the basis for communication really across the animal kingdom. And I'm now going to spend the last part of the lecture getting into how we can connect the neural circuits within the fly brain to these kind of complex behaviors. And before I do that, I'll just give you one example for this behavior, which is um, there's a neuron within the male's brain um, called PIP10. And it happens to be a neuron that resides in the brain and actually descends into the male's spinal cord or ventral nerve cord. Um, there are two of these neurons, one in each hemisphere. So each of those neurons represent a node within this network. Now, in the fruit fly, we have genetic drivers to target these neurons. So we can specifically target those neurons and we can activate them using genetic tools. When we activate that specific neuron, um, we find that we can drive singing. Okay, so here's a little example of song and the pulse mode of song actually has two types of pulses, fast and slow. I didn't have time to tell you about that today. Um, so in fact, there, it turns out there are three modes of song. <coughs> two types of pulses and one, one sign. Um, so if we give this neuron brief activation, we mostly get out these fast pulses. So this is the probability of each type of song being produced over a trial of activation. If we drive the neuron harder, so we give it stronger activation, we start to get a mix of the fast and slow pulses, and now we start to get sign song, which is actually produced at offset. So when the stimulus goes off, then you get the sign song. And then if we give really strong activation that lasts for a long time, we get a mix of all three modes. Okay, so why did I give you this example? Well, it starts to tell us how this neuron um, is related to song 
um, how its activity is actually related to the three modes of song, um, that it must be coupled to a sign neuron because the sign always comes at the offset, right? Um, so maybe it, there's some inhibitory connection between this neuron and another neuron. And um, because it's capable of driving all three modes, um, it's a good candidate for receiving feedback signals that would modulate the choice between modes, sign or pulse, or one type of pulse over the other. And these are the kinds of things that um, set the stage for us to then go and record from a neuron like this to try to understand this behavior, okay? So um, that's just one example. Um, okay, before I transition, I have um, basically about 15 to 20 more minutes of slides. Let me take a look at some of these questions. So, um, let's see. Okay. okay, so somebody asked about decision making in the fly, that maybe there's a complicated neural network, but eventually when a decision is made, it's really about a single neuron. Um, that's a really interesting question. So I guess it's maybe useful to think about the fact that in any nervous system, the muscles of the body are under the control of motor neurons. And there's sort of a finite population of motor neurons that's controlling the muscles, which is generating the actions. Um, and so, you know, these patterns of activity really at the end of the day are about controlling those populations of motor neurons to generate behavior. Um, but I think this example may be a useful one of illustrating how even a single neuron isn't reliably coupled to a single behavior. You know, this neuron is capable of generating all three song modes dependent on whether you activate it weakly or strongly. And that's pretty representative of neurons throughout the nervous system is that the pattern of activity that they get influences how they drive these downstream networks that ultimately connect with motor neurons. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, and somebody asked about whether females sing. It's a good question. Um, in this species, the females are silent. You can kind of see that here. She's running around and she's actually doing behaviors, um, but she's not singing. Now there are other species of Drosophila that sing and we actually study one of them in my lab. Um, Drosophila virilis. So it's very distantly related from Melanogaster, but the females of that species have evolved the ability to sing. And um, we actually use that species as a way to study uh, a process known as duetting. Okay. Um, okay. All right. I think that's a good start with questions. I'm going to keep going and then I will come back to the questions at the end. Oops. Okay, so um, I told you that my lab, in collaboration with Josh Shabitz's lab, has been developing these deep learning tools to track behavior, and I think this is a good point to sort of mention them. So this effort's been um, spearheaded by a graduate student, Talmo Pereira, and um, the method started off with a LEAP, um, which, um, oops, let me go back. Which, uh, uh, is optimized for single animal tracking and has evolved into Sleep, Social Leap, um, which is open source and available at sleep.ai if you guys are interested in uh, trying it out, which is optimized for uh, multi-animal tracking or social interactions. And the idea is that from video, without any labels, um, you can track the joints and the movement of those joints of animals, multiple animals interacting. And so you can see that here, you know, this is the frequency and uh, pattern of motion of each of the joints of the male and the female over time from this video. And so this gives you a richer picture of courtship. Sure, you see the wing extending and vibrating, um, but you also see that there are other behaviors I hadn't mentioned. You know, there's uh, um, turning motion of the legs, there's um, some grooming, um, there are other responses or ways in which the male and female interact that may be useful for us to quantify to fully understand the repertoire of this behavior. And that's kind of what we aim to do now is to get a more complete picture of these interactions, which we can then incorporate into our models to better 
um, solve the connection between neural circuitry and behavior. So these types of methods are really helping us move to the next stage of analysis. Okay, so I wanted to say a bit about connectomes. Um, this morning you heard from two postdocs and a graduate student in my lab who have been using um, connect connectome level um, information about the fly brain. So there's been a huge uh, push of late in Drosophila to generate these connectomes. A lot of that work has come out of uh, Genelia, which is the Howard Hughes Medical uh, Research Institute in Virginia. And um, this EM micrograph actually comes from Genelia, from a um, uh, postdoc, Jihao Zhang, who's now in Sebastian's lab, um, and Dobby Box lab. And um, they generated this EM uh, volume basically by sectioning the fly brain. And what um, we've done uh, in collaboration with Sebastian Sung here at Princeton is uh, to leverage the AI tools that Sebastian's lab has generated to segment this volume. So you can see um, that there are neurons coursing through the volume. Um, you're seeing them on their sides here, kind of being cut as we fly through the section. And the AI tools can segment these neurons, learning the boundaries between them, to reconstruct every neuron in the entire fly brain. This is one female brain, um, and it's really, really amazing. And so using this kind of data, um, I think um, Judy Deutsch talked to you this morning about how we can look at um, organization within circuits. So these are the PC1 neurons he may have mentioned to you. Um, there's a subset of them in each hemisphere of the fly's brain. They have these elaborate arbors, and for some of them, he's mapped all of the neurons that provide input and all of the neurons that provide output. And he actually discovered a strong recurrent circuit, uh, a feedback loop that seems to actually be important for generating um, persistent neural activity within the fly brain. And so these kind of tools are helping us to map the circuits that we can then connect to behavior. So it's been kind of a critical piece to linking um, the brain with behavior coming from the circuitry angle, okay? So once we have the model, we understand sort of the structure of behavior, you know, which pathways are controlling behavior, we can then go and look in those pathways and start to use the circuitry to understand how those neurons are organized. Of course, um, once we have the circuitry, we then need to study activity within the circuitry. And um, that's what I'm gonna tell you about um, now towards the end of the lecture is how we do that. So this is an example from my lab. Um, this is a male fly. He's walking on a spherical treadmill, a little ball that's floating on a pocket of air. <coughs> and um, this male fly has that PIP10 song pathway neuron activated. And that's why he's singing. So you can see that he's vibrating one of his wings. Um, that vibration is actually producing a song. And there are little microphones positioned behind him we can record the song on. Now, this thing right here is a head mount um, that's fixing his head in place. That's why he's not going anywhere. And um, we have a powerful two-photon microscope positioned over this head mount to record neural activity. This is one quarter of his brain. Um, every neuron in the brain uh, is expressing the calcium sensor GCAM, which fluoresces brighter when the neuron becomes active, so has more currents. And um, you can see these flashes, which are these neurons basically becoming more or less active over time. Every time the movie says stim on, we're actually activating this PIP10 neuron. Um, that not only makes the fly sing, um, but it changes patterns of neural activity in the brain. And um, all the while, uh, on the screen placed in front of the fly, which is this kind of white ball you see surrounding this rig, um, we can play movies to the fly. So this is an example movie that we've used in my lab over the last five or so years, um, which is meant to mimic a female. So this is a black square moving on a white background. And the reason it's moving in this very jittery way is because we're actually playing back to the male, the real motion of the female that we recorded during our natural behavioral experiments. And so we can examine then how this movie of fictive female motion um, affects neural activity during song production. So we can link visual activity to song motor activity in this kind of preparation. So this makes it possible then for us 
to go from the connectome and the models of behavior to um, neural activity. Okay. All right, so um, let me see. Okay. Um, Sounds good. I'll come, to, I'll come to some of these questions in the end. I don't think I have to answer them right now. So let me wrap up with the slides and then I'll come back to the questions. Okay, so that's an example of how we can image neural activity in a behaving fly. And so I think before I close out, I wanted to give you another example, um, not from work in my lab, but from um, work in uh, Gwyneth Card's lab, who um, is also at Genelia at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And she's done some really lovely work um, looking at um, state-dependent neural activity. Um, and I thought this would be a way for you all to really easily understand how we link neural activity to behavior. Because the behavior in this case um, is a little bit um, more simplified than the social interaction I was telling you about. Okay, so we talked about dragonflies already and that they like to hunt fruit flies, okay? But now let's, let's flip it and let's think about this problem from the perspective of the fly. If the fly is standing on a leaf, let's say, and the dragonfly approaches it, the fly gets a looming signal on its retina. Um, and what should the fly do? Well, it should take off. It should move its legs, lift its wings, and jump away to avoid being eaten by the dragonfly. Now, a fly, if it's flying, um, may approach a food source, um, let's say a flower to drink some dew off the flower. Um, and when it approaches that food source, that um, uh, landing site is gonna loom towards the fly's retina or its visual system. But the fly should do something different. Instead of escaping, it should actually put out its legs, stop its wings and land. So um, what this says is that there's the same visual feedback, a looming visual cue that should drive two separate behaviors dependent on on whether the fly is already standing or whether it's in flight. And so we can recapitulate that by tethering a fly, um, just as I showed you on the previous slide, allowing it to stand or fly, and then giving it a looming cue on a visual screen and seeing what happens. And you can see that as that visual cue looms, right, and as the size of it gets larger, um, if the fly was standing, it takes off, and if the fly was flying, it lands, okay? All right, so why am I telling you about this? Well. Um, what uh, the card lab discovered is that there's um, two neurons um, named P7 and P10, um, and each of these neurons is bilaterally symmetric. So there's one in the left hemisphere and one in the right hemisphere. And they have their dendrites in the brain, and they have their axons in the ventral nerve cord, which is like the fly's spinal cord. And the axons synapse into three regions, which is where um, the leg motor neurons are, right? Flies have six legs, there's three on each side. So it turns out if you record from this neuron by sticking an electrode into the brain and recording action potentials, and you make the neuron fire, so you activate this neuron, um, the fly's legs will move and they'll move into the landing position. So if you give a flying fly a visual cue, it will move its legs to land, and the same thing happens when you activate either P7 or P10. So these look like landing neurons. When you activate them, you make the fly adopt the landing position. And this is just meant to show you how the legs move upon activation. Okay, um, but then something interesting happens. If the fly is flying and you give it a visual cue that looms, this neuron, either P10 or P7, will fire action potentials um, in response to the loom, that's this gray bar, if it's in flight. Now, if the fly is not flying, if its legs are down, and let's say it's standing on something, so its wings are down, and you give it the same looming cue, these neurons don't really fire action potential. So you get a sub-threshold change in membrane potential, maybe a spike or two, but not as much activity as in the state, which suggests that there's a state dependence here. The fly's brain knows that if I'm not flying, um, I should not be sensitive to this looming cue. Whereas if I am flying, I should be sensitive. And these neurons then become active and they drive the wings to adopt the landing position. 
So that's quite nice, right? That just by recording from these neurons in these states, you're able to link the activity of these neurons to the specific state dependent behavior. <clears throat> so the next step um, would be, of course, to use the connectome, um, which hasn't been done yet, but I'm sure will be done soon, to find the visual pathway inputs and the internal state inputs to this neuron, either of these neurons, to understand how they're integrated to drive um, this particular behavior. And so I hope this example kind of highlights for you how um, you, you know, just one or two neurons within the brain might give you a handle on how to think about circuitry, um, integration of information, and the activation of specific behaviors. Now, humans have many more neurons, right? We're not likely to have single um, or pairs of descending neurons that drive specific behavior, um, but this helps us to frame and understand the problem. So as we scale up to more neurons, um, we sort of have a foundation in mind of how um, smaller numbers of neurons can actuate these behaviors, um, and then we can start to build models of how you might scale up the numbers to get similar kinds of behaviors with more complicated nervous systems. And often that greater complication comes from the fact that you know, the legs may have to do so many different things in humans, or you, the neurons in the brain may have to integrate many, many more inputs. Um, but sort of the fundamental organization or structure of the um, architecture of the circuitry and its relationship to behavior might be preserved. Okay, so with that, I just wanted to come back to the slide to sort of highlight for you sort of uh, the utility of working on these simpler systems for connecting circuits with behavior, how we might do that using the fly. And I think um, for the last 10 minutes or so, I can try to answer as many of your questions as possible. So um, let's just start here. We'll start at the end and work our way back to the beginning. So um, uh, somebody asked whether the P7 neuron, um, you know, why does it fire more action potentials in the flight state than in the non-flight state? So let me just go back to that slide so everybody's clear. Um, so the question was about this. Why are there more action potentials here versus here? Um, the answer is, um, you know, we don't necessarily um, know just yet, um, but the idea is that there's neurons in the brain that um, are encoding state. So they're active when the fly flies, maybe, and not active when the fly is standing still. And those neurons provide modulation to the P7 neuron to control what we think of as its excitability, how easy it is for the visual cue to excite this neuron versus not excite it. And um, the connectome can help us to find the inputs to these neurons so that we can test that hypothesis. Okay. Um, and somebody asked whether, um, Okay, somebody asked whether the connectome will be sufficient for answering these kind of high level questions about the brain. And the answer is no. The connectome is, is uh, people like to say it's absolutely necessary and completely insufficient. And the reason, as you can see, is that, you know, if you want to go from a behavior and physiology like this uh, to the inputs, the visual and internal state inputs to these neurons, you need the connectome. But once you have it, it isn't the answer. The answer lies in the dynamics. You know, how, what are the activity patterns of these neurons? How do those activities sum um, or multiply to give you the output of this neuron? There's certainly going to be a lot of nonlinearities involved in the way in which these kinds of neurons um, integrate their inputs. And those are the kinds of things you can really only figure out by recording from the neuron in behavior. And so, it's kind of a, a, a cycle of using the connectome and testing it with experiments and back again. Okay. Um, oops, great. Um, okay, somebody wanted to know about overfitting of models um, like the GLM. And um, we can go back. 
to, we can stay on this slide actually. So um, yes, it's possible to overfit these models. And um, you know, sometimes you'll see that um, the performance starts to get worse uh, as you add more parameters, you know, and so that starts to tell you that you're overfitting, okay? Um, I would say that for us, um, yeah, and actually um, seeing where the sweet spot is between you know, too few and too many parameters can sort of tell you um, where your models are most likely to be uh, most useful. Um, for us, we always have to go back to the uh, experimental model system to test the model. So the model tells us, it kind of gives us the roadmap to how behavior works, kind of like the connectome. Um, but then to really understand the link, we have to make manipulations. We have to turn on and off neurons. And I gave you this example. Um, let me see here if I can go back. Um, this example of um, you know this uh, PIP10 neuron, which is a neuron in the male brain, which um, drives uh, song patterns. And so the idea was that um, you know, by testing with neural activation, how that neuron generates song patterns, we can start to understand the relationship between the model and the uh, behavior of the animal. We could also then record from neurons like this, um, et cetera. So it's really the experiments that um, help us to validate and test the models and, um, you know, make it such that I actually believe, uh, believe the answers. Okay. Um, and I would say that that's a power of the fly system that you can so easily test these models. You can go back to the behavior, you can do the neural recordings, you can make the manipulation. Having that kind of back and forth feedback between theory and experiment, I think is one major power of the model system. Um, somebody asked about differences between computer simulation and uh, insects. So, um, you know, I think, uh, there are people who are interested in, for example, simulating uh, the brain of the fly in silico and making tests there. And I think that could be quite powerful for helping us to see if we truly understand the way the circuit connects to behavior. Um, so I'm, I think those are, that's an exciting direction. At the moment, the fly brain is already so complicated that it's difficult to do this. And so um, you know, I think um, we still have a ways to go with trying to fully recapitulate fly behavior. So we can build models that predict some aspects of the fly behavior, but certainly can't recapitulate all behaviors under all contexts. Um, you know, perhaps we'll be able to get there soon, um, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, and let's see. Um, I think I've talked a bit about why flies are a good model system. So I'll take that question off. Um, somebody wanted to know about how you might elicit behaviors like hand movement um, with uh, you know, activation or electrodes when there are so many neurons in the brain and they're interconnected. And um, we didn't actually really have time to talk about this, um, but you know, even though there's a lot of interconnectivity, there are sort of you know, pathways within the brain where some connections are stronger than others. Um, there's, you know, convergence and expansion, um, some feedback loops, but that still converge on common outputs. And as I said, really, a lot of this has to talk to the motor neurons and the ultimate output of the nervous system. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we quite yet have a complete model that can predict, for example, um, you know, uh, hand movement, um, but, uh, you know, these uh, kinds of things can be done in the fly where, you know, we can um, use the circuitry in combination with models of behavior to understand um, decisions to stick out a wing or decisions to produce one type of song mode over the other, given the connectivity in the brain. I'm very excited about those kinds of models. So basically taking something like the GLM and overlaying onto it circuitry to try to link the two together. Um, okay. Let's see. 
Um, so somebody asked, uh, uh, there's a few questions here about um, the connectome, whether uh, it provides enough information to emulate brain activity, what's the ratio of input and output neurons, um, you know, how do you, um, how do you map pathways within the connectome? And um, actually a lot of that remains to be done. Um, so, you know, these uh, connectomes are, we don't actually yet have a connectome for the fly brain. We have um, a partial connectome um, that was generated at uh, Genalia, it's called the hemibrain. Um, there is uh, a full connectome that we're trying to generate using the data I showed you. Uh, there are other projects in the works. Um, and so, you know, we're starting to get clues from the neural circuitry, but we don't yet have the complete wiring diagram. That's something that the Drosophila field just hasn't yet achieved, but it's uh, in the works. And so I think a lot of these questions about um, how to use the connectome and how to, how its utility will be answered in the coming years. So stay tuned for that. Um, Let's see. Um, somebody asked about um, if you have multiple models to explain a behavior, how do you know which one is the correct one? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and one I think that's really important to think about if you're going to do any kind of modeling work, whether it's of neural activity or of behavior. Um, and I think maybe Bill Bialik may have talked a little bit about this last week. Um, I don't know if he had time to get into uh, the neuroscience problems he works on. But, um, you know, I think <clears throat> there's some value in having a null model and also trying to understand the degree to which you can predict the behavior and searching for models that offer more predictive power. Um, but as I said already, I think it's very important to validate these models with experimental tests. So to go back to the system and actually make a perturbation um, or do a recording that tests the model specifically and see if it holds up. Um, that's sort of the number one way in which my lab validates these models and gains confidence in them um, to then use them to describe the brain. And um, you know, it's not always possible to do that in other model systems. Maybe if you work on monkeys or a, a model system that's more complex, um, you know, it's not as easy to go back and do these experiments to validate models, but I think it is a real power of the system. Okay, well, um, I see a few other questions here. They'll all be saved and I can answer them um, online. So I would encourage you, um, if your question didn't get answered today, um, to um, put it in the Google Sheet where you're placing your questions. And I promise to come back and, and answer any remaining questions. Maybe you can flag your question with an asterisk if it wasn't answered, um, and I can type out an answer for you uh, and for others to see. Um, I'm also happy if uh, you want to get in touch to um, continue the conversation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to share uh, work from my field and some of our work with you uh, today. And um, I hope that um, you know, you, you got a lot out of it. Um, thanks so much. Um, thanks to the organizers for putting this together. And um, yeah, best of luck to all of you.